I, I will say a few words about intersections of gender and Buddhism before giving the floor to our guest speakers. Now you can in my back. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody coming? No? Okay. So the scholar or the student of religion whose research interest relates to women and gender is often asked about the status or the position of women, for example, in particular, religious doctrines or practices, or in a certain culture and society. I'm repeatedly asked about the status of the female in Buddhism, about the position of Tibetan women and especially about the status of Tibetan nuns I have studied. Despite the importance of these questions, this, there seem not to be simple answers to them. In fact, many tensions and conflicting views seem to prevail when the status of women in Buddhism, Buddhism is, at, uh, is at stake. When we investigate the Buddhist texts, we can see that many Buddhist sutras and folk beliefs promote negative or ambivalent ideas of the feminine. Women are seen as both emotional and wise, as well as devils and goddesses. Liberation or enlightenment is seen as more difficult or even impossible for women because of the female body. The negative ideas of the feminine found in the Buddhist sutras and folk beliefs are sometimes contrasted with the Buddhist tantras, which are seen as filled with positive ideas and symbols of the feminine. However, it is far from clear how the tantras have affected the actual empirical position and self-conception of Buddhist women. Thus, previous textual studies have often characterized the conceptions of women in Buddhism as contradictory, ambivalent, or multifocal. Moreover, several studies have pointed out the vast discrepancy that continues to exist in many Buddhist societies. Namely, that despite their considerable social and spatial freedom, women still have few opportunities to devote themselves to religious life. In most Buddhist countries today, the full monastic ordination limit for women has died out, and thus most Buddhist nuns are only able to receive the novice ordination, if even that. In the Tibetan Buddhist context, scholars studying, uh, studying Tibetan women have faced the challenge of reconciling the different and often contradicting dimensions found in the religious and social statuses of Tibetan women. While the nuns' lower position or lower position is often acknowledged by Tibetan society and by scholars, the high status of Tibetan women has frequently been emphasized. When the high status of lay women has been highlighted, it has nevertheless been suggested that despite the lower prestige, Life as a nun provides women with opportunities she could not enjoy as a lay woman. woman. These conflicting views suggest that Buddhism is not only important in legitimizing the inequality encountered by the Buddhist women, but it can also be seen uh, as at the same time empowering them. It can be suggested that intersectionality of a theory and method for analyzing the status as well as dimensions of power and agency in more varied ways. In feminist research, intersectionality refers to the insight according to which various dimensions of social identities and status positions, including gender, race, class, and sexuality, do not operate as unitary entities, but as reciprocal components that construct, produce, and maintain multifaceted social inequalities. Thus, when trying to understand the relationship between women and religion, it is not enough to focus merely on gender and religion. Apart from religious doctrines and practices, gender intersects many other dimensions. Buddhist women are not, uh, not merely women and religious practitioners. Uh, <coughs> sorry. They are also women with a certain social and economic position, women with a race, a nationality, and women women of different ages, social backgrounds, uh, sexual orientations, and ordination status. Accordingly, whether their status is low or high depends on the various intersections of these positions and identities. 
when the status of Buddhist women is looked at and analyzed from the viewpoint of intersectionality, the question of status thus becomes extremely complex and multifaceted. Today, Buddhism is practiced by increasing numbers of people, for example, in the Americas and Europe, and Buddhism has become the fastest growing religion in Australia and some other Western countries. What has the trans transmission of Buddhism to the West and the interaction with Western people meant to Buddhism and for the gender relations in Buddhism? It has been argued that contact with West and Western people has somewhat changed the perspe perception of women's religious capabilities in many Buddhist traditions and that Buddhism has thus become more equal. In fact, one of the most significant changes has been the restoration of the full ordination lineage for nuns. This initiative came from Western Buddhist nuns who brought Western feminism into the Buddhism. For Western practitioner, uh, sorry, for Western Buddhist female practitioners, uh, the intersection of the Western ideas, the ideas of equality with Buddhism and gender often means that they have more opportunities than their Asian counterparts, for example, for religious education. Western Buddhist women also seem to serve as Dharma teachers more often than Asian Buddhist women. Interestingly, a position as a recognized Dharma teacher, as an ordinated nun, or as a priest, does not necessarily mean a high or an ambitious position for Western female Buddhists. Despite their achievements, they can find themselves in the margin of both traditional Buddhist hierarchies and in Western society. Bhikshuni Tupten Sertron, a Western-born nun in a Tibetan tradition, uh, some time back wrote about the lives of Western Buddhist nuns. According to her, while Western Buddhist nuns are not bound by certain gender-based pressures within Asian society, uh, they are neither an integral part of, for example, in this case, the Tibetan religious establishment, whose hierarchy consists of Tibetan monks. Furthermore, according to Bhikshuni Tukten Chodron, Western Buddhist nuns are an oddity in the West. Western society might brand nuns as lazy parasites who don't want to work and who deny their sexuality and refuse to reproduce. Uh, the incident, see, she uh, describes is telling. A stranger approached a nun in a, and in a conciliatory way said, don't worry dear, after the chemo is finished, your hair will grow back again. We have now an opportunity to hear two distinguished female practitioners of Buddhism and find out about their views and experiences as Westerners, women and Buddhists and how they think these identities intersect. And if this resonates with those experienced by Bhikshuni Tupten Sertron at all. So we have Honorable Olozamienten who will give a talk about the relative and ultimate roots of gender. And she has been a nun for 15 years. And after completing the Buddhist studies program at the Synthetic Institute in Australia, she continued to study, retreat, and offer service at Buddhist centers in India, Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand, becoming an in-depth registered teacher within the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mayana Tradition, FBMT, and Venerable Yonten has served previously as the resident teacher in Gunsan Yese Retreat Center in Australia, and at the Mahamudra Center for Universal Unity in New Zealand. And currently she is an FBMT touring teacher and rigid leader, as well as a member of, Buddhist, uh, of the Buddhist faculty at the Buddhist Psychoanalytic Training Program, Humans, Human Spirits in Lod, Israel. While also teaching regularly at the Sandileva study group in Israel. <laughs> and then we have Mitva Virta Perko, whose presentation is about the changing roles and representations of women in Zen. 
And Mitra Virlaperko, she started to practice Zen in Helsinki Zen Center in 2002 with Swedish Zen masters Kanya Udland Rossi and Santa Paroma Rossi and was ordained as a Zen Buddhist priest in 2014. And she has been living four years in the full-time Zen training in Zen Gordon, a head temple of Zen Buddhist Samfundet in rural Sweden, where her teachers mainly live and teach. In Helsinki Zen Center, she has been a Sangha or Buddhist community leader since year 2009. And she currently divides her time between the city Sangha in Helsinki and temple training in Zen Gordon. So after the presentation, we still have plenty of time for the questions and discussion. But now I will give the floor to Venerable Losang Yenten. So, um, uh, thanks for having me in your country. So far, it's a beautiful country uh, with friendly people. Who knows what's really the case? <laughs> but um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think um, when we talk about gender, we are really talking about the self. And the self is an interesting concept in all kind of spiritual traditions, in psychology. Um, and I think we really want to examine, you know, very gently, and in the abstract what the self is so that it's not confronting. But then when we kind of get used to these conversations to bring it gradually more and more personal to our direct experience and see how it lands. I think sometimes if we um, come too quickly with a concept to the personal, um, we can become reactive and rebellious and almost make our identity even more concrete and even more problematic. Um, and so I, I just, you know, as an experiment, as a thought experiment, as we talk today, to kind of hold these ideas lightly in the abstract and then just very gently bring them into your own experience and see what sticks and what resonates with your own logic, what resonates with your life experience. Okay, so um, if I use terms that are strange, please just interrupt and I can clarify. But um, I guess to start out with, it's important to kind of define, at least conversationally, what do we mean when we say relative truth, and what do we mean when we say ultimate truth. So relative truth from a Buddhist perspective is the conventional. So it is the way we agree on things in the world, like to say this is a table, but even more subtle than language, the conception of table-ness that is here in this space. The relative is by nature deceptive. And the reason why the relative is by nature deceptive is that it appears to exist in the opposite way to how it actually is. It really seems like the table is telling us that it's a table from its side. It doesn't seem like, as a child, we were introduced to the concept of table and the definition of it to be something you put something on or use for food. We forget that it was learned to attribute label on this basis. Because it happened so long ago, and it was repeated so many times, that now it sort of jumps out at us as obvious. The same is true parts is greater than the whole. That's what it feels like. When in fact, the self is just the label we place on the collection of parts. And those collection of parts are not independent, are not inherently existent, are not self-created, and yet they feel like ours and me. And so we just kind of unpeel this a little bit and look at the relative basis even more superficially than what we would normally talk about in philosophy classes, just the really external, okay, who are you? So first, you maybe think of the train of thought in your head or the feelings you have, or the traits that you have that you particularly enjoy and feel value about, like maybe you have a good sense of humor or you're intelligent, or the traits you particularly disagree with and feel a lot of shame about, like maybe you get lost easily in traffic, I don't know. So your traits feel like you. Also your body feels like you, or it feels like a house that you live in. And either way is somewhat problematic, 
<coughs> but to just think of in terms of your lived experience, we do very much identify with the body, even though we know something more subtle is happening with the mind. And so the body becomes kind of one of your representations of the self. And then we get into conversations about gender. And it feels so obvious to most people what their gender is and what that means in their daily life. Forgetting at what point that gender felt like me. Did, did your gender feel like an intrinsic part of you in the womb while you were being developed? Or was it after a few years of being a baby? Or was it the first time you noticed there was differences in your organs between you and some of your friends? What is the basis on which you label your gender? Is it your chromosomes? Is it your genitalia? Is it your ability to reproduce or how reproduction happens? Is it your way of thinking? And is it a combination of those things? And also, given your society, what does it mean to be a man or a woman, or to be somewhere in between, or both? What is the spectrum of masculine and feminine within your society? And then what is decided on as acceptable or unacceptable for your role? And those things aren't like, you're not sat down and taught them in school necessarily. Here is what boys do, here is what girls do. You are this one, so do that. It's not like it's spoon-fed into you in a direct way but it kind of filters into you, and then it feels like it's you. Do you agree-ish? It kind of leaks into you so much so that then it feels like that's how you've always been or that's who you are intrinsically. And if that's comfortable, you don't worry about it. And it's, if it's uncomfortable, there's a lot of stress in your life, but not usually do we take a step back from that whole process of being kind of like a sponge and ask, who is there anyway? Am I my body? Am I my mind? Who is there? So the relative self does function in the relative world, and we can't jump the step of noticing the influences that are a part of us. That would be an exaggeration. That would be what we call in Buddhism sometimes spiritual bypassing. Um, to say, that there is no impact on my experience because I have the label female or the label American or the label nun, um, you know, or the label whatever my age is or how I perceive my level of whatever attractiveness, intelligence, education, etc. To say those things don't matter would be an exaggeration, but it would also be an exaggeration to say those things are me. So what is left? If those things are not you, who are you? And that is a kind of a, a groundless feeling that we want to play with a little bit because if you can kind of even have the, the boundaries of who you are soften a little, then conceptions of me and you, us and them, teams, start to dissolve a little bit. And why do you even want that disillusion of boundaries? Well, because as soon as you feel there's separation between you and the other, there is attachment to those who support you and aversion to those who don't. And that push and pull in the mind agitates its clarity and makes you less able to access natural clarity, natural contentment. Um, it disturbs the ability of your mind to transform and grow. And so this, this push and pull that's always happening in our mind of trying to bring close to us that which supports us and push away from us that which seems to harm us is built on the lie of our identity. And yet the identity is there and needs to be acknowledged. So this is the relative truth, ultimate truth dance we're trying to play with, is to look at from the conventional side, you can say there is this part, there is that part, there are these experiences from the ultimate you realize none of this exists in and of itself from its own side. That the significance we attribute to certain traits is not naturally abiding significance. It's importance that we decided to give something. And the more importance we give to one aspect of our identity, the more potential there is for conflict. So what we're wanting to do is to acknowledge our own identity features, not to ignore them, but to land on them a little bit more lightly and realize that it's only within a context that these labels 
hold water, right? It's only within a certain context. So sometimes when we're trying to soften the lines of male and female, it's easier for us to change the terminology to masculine and feminine. So masculine and feminine are far more kind of mental states, whereas male and female feel a bit more physical. Do you know what I mean? So to say that masculine and feminine exist on a spectrum, and that spectrum exists within a cultural context and within the lived experience of one individual, that's a, a conversation we can play with a little bit and do in society. To say, um, I am a woman is very easy and clear for me given my upbringing and my background and the way I've been socialized, but as soon as I'm next to another woman, the question becomes who is the more masculine, who is the more feminine, and what does that mean in terms of our power dynamic? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And the same is true of men, right? If you're a man alone, you're a man. If you're a man next to another man, who is the more manly man, right? <laughs> and what does that mean in terms of happiness and authority and safety and truth? Yeah? And so uh, it, these are just interesting things to play with a little bit and to realize that however you land on the spectrum of masculine and feminine does not inherently exist as good or bad, functional or dysfunctional, all of that lives within a context as well. And if you're holding very, very tightly to an identity, there is a more natural suspicion and fear of anything other. So, uh, you know, the lived experience of this for myself personally is that, you know, I was brought up by very um, progressive parents who were very kind of old classic hippies, right? Um, who uh, were very live and let live, very open-minded. And probably they thought my act of rebellion would be to be a conformist, yeah? <laughs> to um, be a classic American cheerleader meeting, a, you know, marrying a football player. <laughs> to them would be the highest act of rebellion and they were fearing it, I think. Yeah, she's gonna be conventional, she'll be a flight attendant, no. yeah? Um, when in fact, the, you know, perhaps an act of rebellion or perhaps a response to their wisdom or some combination of the two is that I'm a Buddhist nun. Now, First of all, I cut all my hair off, which to hippie parents is a big deal, because their act of rebellion was to grow it, right? And then the second piece is that, what do you mean celibacy? We're about sexual liberation, damn it. What do you mean be celibate? That's nuts. Yeah, that's a recipe for madness. Have you seen the Catholic Church, etc. cetera, right? Um, and, and I think what's interesting is to play with what does it mean to rebel against type? What does it mean to respond to your environment in a way that's unexpected? And what does that say about your progress on the spiritual path? And is some act of rebellion needed in order to become curious about how you wound up this way in the first place? So sometimes when we talk about gender, we're also talking about developmental stages and how we are responding to the pressures of our experience so far. What do we want to do with our history? What of our history was useful for facilitating connection and growth? And what about our history led to more alienation and fear? And this is a process all of us are going through all of our life, but in particular in those kind of really crucial developmental stages around our teenage years or our young adulthood. And then we forget, just like we forgot that we learned what a table was and we learned what the letter, letter A was, we forget that we learned our identity, or we decided on it. Because now that we're adults, it's become so familiar, it seems concrete. It seems permanent. And now all it is is this self, which is permanent and unitary and independent. Now that self is just kind of aging, right? But it's not changing in any other way besides sort of gathering a few experiences to it, getting rid of a few habits, and just the body wears out. Yeah, that's what it kind of feels like. It doesn't feel like the identity has as much choice as it used to. But a lot of us, when we were teenagers, experimented with different ways of living in our skin. We experimented with different ideas about career, but also different things about how to communicate to who and when. We also were playing with what does our gender mean to us? If I have this label woman or this label man, what kind of man or woman am I? 
was the relationship between what I look like and how I function within that space. There was more play in those years, but at some point we just landed, yeah? And it was so long ago for a lot of us that we forgot there was a decision process and there was choice involved. And so when we're looking again at our relative self, we want to notice which habits got hardwired to the point where they feel choiceless. And what has that done to our experience of connection with other people? And is there anything we can do with that? Because also it leads to um, classic issues in politics where when you disagree with other people, it, you don't necessarily go into their shoes. How did they come up with that worldview? Where did their logic arise from? We just immediately think, how can I dominate their wrong view with my right view? <laughs> Right? How can I shame them into submission? Or how can I prove them foolish and stupid? We don't try to meet them where they are and kind of go into the lived experience of their identity and why on earth they would come up with such a view. But we all know that when we listen to advice from other people, it's because we were open to it, not because it was forced on us. So again, we just want to keep looking at our different aspects of identity and just Acknowledging them, but with that light touch that says only within a context am I the most feminine in the room. Only within a certain context am I the most intelligent in the room. Only within a certain context am I the youngest or the oldest or whatever that means. And then looking, there's even a layer beyond that of what is the significance I gave to those things I observed. Why did I observe those things as opposed to other things? And also, what is the boundary where I stop and you begin? And where are my thoughts even coming from? Because even our very thought process feels like ours. When in fact, the thoughts that are in your head are influenced by the temperature of this room, by what you're wearing, if it's comfortable or not, by who is nearby you, by the sound of my voice, the sound of the outside, your relationship with the English language, etc etc so to find a core personality deciding to think your thoughts is an exaggeration so in buddhism we talk about two selves there's the self that exists and the self that does not exist the self that does not exist is the one that seems to exist inherently and it is the one we identify with the self we think we are is the self that is not there at all the self that is there, is there relatively labeled on the basis of the parts, the body and mind. But again, when you search within the body and the mind for the self, you will not find it. Search within the body, you can say this is Yintin's body here, right? From a distance you can say that. But as soon as you try to point to my body, you're pointing to a part, right? It's my shoulder, right? And then you say, oh, that's Yunjin's shoulder, solid, inherently existent shoulder. Where is the shoulder? Is it the part of the joint, that part of the joint? Is it the cartilage? Is it the ligaments? Where is the shoulder, right? So anything you point to doesn't collapse into nothingness. It dissolves into parts, which themselves have parts, which themselves have parts. So you understand why sometimes Buddhists are seen as nihilists when in fact they're not. We're not saying everything is empty, we're saying everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. Yeah, so you say, okay, so I am merely labeled female. How does that change my worldview? Yeah, I'm labeled female on the basis of a traditionally female set of characteristics. But what if I did some genetic testing and found out that despite my female looking body, I had male chromosomes? Identity crisis or just interesting, right? What if I went to another culture where the expectations of women were so dramatically different than my upbringing that my whole identity was called into question, right? Because we know just when we travel around, the expectations of gender are so different place to place, generation to generation, that to say this is the essence of gender is an exaggeration. Yes, what does it mean to be this? And so when we're looking for the I or the self, on the basis of the body or the basis of the mind, we are exaggerating. 
when we're looking at the parts as having a function and kind of a, a like, for lack of a better word, word, a filtration system through which we access a limited part of reality, it's a little closer to truth. Do you have any comments or questions about these thoughts? Do you understand? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so if you understand, then do you agree or disagree? Um, I said so good. No. No. Yes, I saw it. I got to the. It's just a toy that I need to go. No, I don't need to go. About the identity? Um. Onko sitten syytä nyt sitten ajatella, so, <laughs> so, 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 so should we identify? No. Should we identify to something? Anything. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. What is the thing that we should, should identify, identify with? with? Ah, mm -hmm. yes, yes. yes. Um, and should you identify yeah. at all? Yeah. 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 Mm. What should you identify with and should you identify at all? Yeah, very yes. good question. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. Yes. This is a very good question and uh, you decide. <laughs> but um, look, like if I'm very honest uh, from a very Buddhist perspective, if you're going to choose anywhere to land on identity, it's going to be exaggerated. But, just for the sake of living without cr being crazy, we would say a nice place to place your identity is on what we call Buddha nature, which is the lack of inherently existent mind. Which means your mind is able to transform, which means your mind's potential is expandable, that you can grow into your fullest potential. That the negative states of mind like anger and attachment and jealousy and pride that are born from the innate ignorance about identity and self, that those are extra. Yeah, that all of our weird habits that are unkind or harmful to ourselves and others, these are additional. These are um, adventitious, we say in English, but it just it means extra. They don't permeate the fundamental essence of the mind. They just kind of create trends of habit. But they are not us, so they are not worth identifying with. But so too our skills, right? Because all of our skills are learned. So I guess, you know, kind of a shortcut intermediate step for what to identify with is your mind's ability to change and transform in positive ways. That no matter how strange your habits get or how solid your identity feels, you will never ruin the mind's ability to change and transform if you give it some effort. Um, so we call that Buddha nature or Buddha potential which doesn't mean that you're already a Buddha and just need to wake up to it. It means that the nature of your mind, because it's empty of inherent existence, can transform. So, I don't know if that helps. Yeah. But yeah, your choice, your choice. I think uh, just noticing that you have choice is a big deal. Yeah, like I, I often think, what does it mean to be American? Right? If I've lived most of my life, almost most of my life, out of America, almost half-half, what if I found out my mother actually gave birth to me in Canada? I would be excited, <laughs> actually, because I would have health care then. But, you know, like, what would that say about me? Yeah. Um, you know, if I, if I identify very strongly as, for example, American, which I feel more strongly in other countries than when I'm in America, then I immediately feel very, like, apologetic. Yeah? If I'm feeling my Americanness, I feel very apologetic for many reasons that you could guess. <laughs> yes, um, I I feel um, the stereotypes of my culture and know that some of them are true. <laughs> right, um, and if that if that identity feature I feel is me, then if someone is critical of Americans, I'm hurt, and if someone is praising of Americans, I'm happy. 
or um, worried that they don't know the full story, <laughs> right? But if I just think, look, merely labeled American on the basis of having born in this area on Earth, then I can be criticized or praised and it not land and transform into a negative state of mind like attachment or anger or pride. But if I identify as, immediately there's a recipe for an affliction, yeah? If I think I am a woman labeled on this basis, but if I think woman is me, or that is fundamental meanness, then immediately there's a subtle suspicion or fear or anger or worry about those who look non-woman, yeah? If I'm on the train and a man sits next to me, I might be a little afraid or a little nervous or a little something, but if another woman sits next to me, I relax. Because intrinsic in over-identification is suspicion, yeah? And yet, it is true that as a merely labeled woman, we are merely labeled more vulnerable. In some context, merely labeled, right? And so it's like, you have to play with these two things and not land too hard on either while still functioning within the world. Because sometimes I've given up all labels or tried to and then got it into even more trouble. I remember traveling in India by myself and sometimes in India, people assume I'm a man because I'm hard to gender and I'm tall. But sometimes it's clear that they have sussed out I'm a girl. And then they have like, you're by yourself, you're white. Sometimes, to them, they merely label prostitute, right? Because Western women are easy, right? Those robes. Right, obviously, right, <laughs> obviously. But, you know, that's the thing is that, you know, if you're white and you're a woman, there are some people who have habituated their minds to an assumption that is sometimes correct and sometimes incorrect. But, you know, then there is some danger that's there. So if I'm pretending that's not the case, I'm vulnerable. And, you know, and I've almost gotten into some really scary situations pretending those things weren't true or trying to hold myself out of identity. So how do you notice that these things exist while at the same time knowing they do not exist from their own side? And so for us, you know, we would say as beginners, and we want to kind of keep that open beginner's mind as long as we can, we just consciously go back and forth between what is the relative truth and the ultimate truth, and realizing that the ultimate truth is the emptiness of inherent existence, but the quickest way to access some taste of that is to look at dependent arising and to say, based on these set of conditions, I merely label that in this context gently, but it's subject to change. If I find out more, I can be flexible. And in that flexibility means more room to connect. And I think for us as kind of relative creatures, connection is the closest we come to tasting ultimate truth in daily life outside of our meditation practice. And that meditation practice, probably we only have a taste if we're very advanced practitioners. So, you know, notice the way you feel when you feel connected to the people around you, when you feel relaxed with them, when you feel related to them. The difference in your identity experience sometimes is quieter when you're with your people. So what we're trying to do is to expand the radius of what your people feel like until it's just connection wherever there are people. And then eventually you realize even the concept that one thing connects to another is a slight exaggeration or a major exaggeration, depending on your philosophical school of thought. But at least you're moving in the right direction. I think um, some forms of psychotherapy very much soothe the Western mind because they build connections between yourself and your emotions, between yourself and the people in your life, they're building connections. In Buddhism, we're trying to reveal the fact those conditions are already there. Those connections are already there, yeah? Because the, the underlying assumption is that once you feel connection, there is peace, yeah? And more wisdom is possible. So just very gently, gently, we play with these issues. Um, if it's uh, unclear, please ask questions. Or if you want to argue, please do. <laughs> One of my friends just told me that every human, human being has a female 
size and a male size. Yeah. So it's so but this was quite a good argument, I think. Yeah. So you are not such a female or male, you are both sides of the I think that that's a really beautiful way to live, the recognition that we have both sides. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I think, you know, even acknowledging the fact that we have a binary idea of gender is a symptom of the dualism in our mind anyway, that we always are dividing things into two, dividing, 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 and that's a symptom of our innate ignorance. But if at least we can look at the divisions and bring them together within ourselves, we're doing really well. You know, and to notice that we have a masculine and a feminine side, all of us. And the more we can um, be at peace with both sides, the easier it is to relate to others and feel content within ourselves. Definitely. Yeah. Thoughts? Maybe I hand over to Mitra? Okay. Yes. Please. You can you can ask later yeah. after Mitra's presentation. You can ask later, or also you can ask to now. During. During. <laughs> During. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, I always actually I always like it very much when people are interrupting me when I'm giving a talk because uh, yeah then I get immediate response about what I have been forgetting or 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 what needs to be clarified or just hear about what you feel and think. So please do. Uh, yes, uh, Venerable and also Mitra H. Oh, you were both speaking about so interesting thing, things that I had to write some comments here yeah. down <laughs> so, during your talk. Uh, the Venerable was starting and speaking mostly about the, the, the process of identification or ident our habit to identify uh, ourselves with something, some things, uh, like gender. And I would like to kind of look at the whole concept of Buddhism from this, I'll start with uh, looking at the, what is Buddhism about? Is there something called Buddhism? And what it is, if there is? There is this uh, Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh who uh, has said several times that Buddhism is made of completely un-Buddhist elements, and only that. And I do agree with, with him. Uh, also, because all these elements, all the components that actually make Buddhism Buddhism can be found in other traditions, other practice paths. And also, because of the great variety within the Buddhist world, I think it's very difficult, or you have to be very, very aware of this when you speak about Buddhism. So there are, even when all the Buddhist schools and traditions are following the basic teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha, and uh, still uh, there is this great, great variety about how you practice these uh, teachings, how you put them into action. Really, that's a great variety. And uh, also, this applies to Zen. It's the same thing uh, within the Zen world, that there is absolutely nothing called Zen. That would be <laughs> like intrinsically like one entity called Zen. But within the Zen world, we have like we have this whole umbrella under the word Zen. We have different kinds of traditions, different kind of schools, different kind of approaches from the most traditional to the most uh, untraditional and modern uh, that you can ever imagine of. And uh, that's why I thought that I would just like to say uh, some something about these concepts and words like teacher, priest, nun, monk. Mm. And what do they actually mean in, in many Zen schools? <laughs> uh, uh, well, actually there is nothing that I could say generally about Zen. 
because these terms, they really, they can mean basically anything. Most often people think that if you are a monk or nun in Zen tradition, that means that you are, um, have made vows of celibacy, you are probably f uh, following the traditional monk and nun con conduct vinaya, at least in some way, ways. Maybe sometimes you are more relaxed with that uh, in your school than some other schools, but basically you are following that. Uh, and. Uh, but even this is not true, because there are many Zen schools uh, that call, for instance, monks, people who are just, who can be married, and but who have had some sort of deep, uh, some ceremony, connection, ordination to that tradition, to that practice tradition. Uh, uh, and then what is a Zen priest? I think that's as a word that is a little bit more, a little bit less common that word, uh, word monk and nun. And it's coming from Japanese background, Japanese tradition. Uh, like uh, my school is originally coming from Japan. It came from Japan first to United States and from United States to Finland and Sweden and Finland. So. So basically, traditionally, the word uh, priest has meant a Japanese married monk and not, know nothing about uh, women. Uh, and then a teacher or a Zen master. Uh, also, this varies. In some Zen schools, a teacher is really the master. He is the or she is the spiritual master who embodies the Buddha wisdom. Uh, and then in some other schools, teachers, especially I think especially in the West nowadays, teachers can be like experienced senior practitioners who kind of assist and help other people with their practice, but who are not really kind of supposed to be a living example of Prashna wisdom, the Buddhist wisdom. Uh, so, and in, in the tradition where I come from, uh, the Zen priest can be a woman or a man, and, uh, and uh, a teacher is actually the master, the Zen master. So if, if you are a teacher, then it means that you, the standards are pretty high. <laughs> yes. Uh, And maybe I just say uh, very quickly about what it is to be priest, because usually people really don't <laughs> know about it. In my tradition, uh, basically it's a, it's a person who, is, who has put her personal practice as the main thing in her life or his life. And uh, in our school, <coughs> the priests don't get children. So they, don't, they can't be in charge of raising up a family, which I think it's very natural because because uh, of, the, of the responsibility, that is huge. And that is, the idea is that you are able to give that energy to the Sangha work and your own personal practice. Uh, and we can marry and nowadays our priests in our school use normal kind of clothing as I do nowadays, have a kind of no normal, sort of normal, uh, haircut and we are not celibate. Uh, yes, so that was something about the concepts. Uh, it was great that you talked so much about the kind of the absolute aspect of the of the identity and that was exactly what I hoped for <laughs> because then I thought then I can talk about more about the relative part. <laughs> yes, I hate to talk about that part. <laughs> yes, uh, about uh, the roles and representations of women in Zen and maybe especially in the West. Uh, it's very important to realize in where and in what kind of historical situation Zen actually came to West. 
So there were two waves. The first kind of wave was in the beginning of the 20th century, but that was maybe mostly kind of academic. So there were just very few practice centers. So it was more that this basic idea, concept of something like Zen became slowly somehow known. And then the big kind of, uh, the much more influential wave was in the 60s. And uh, Zen came, I would say that first it came to the United States and then after that to Europe. And the 60s, of course, was a very interesting time at the United States. So because that was the time, well, when I was writing this and thinking of this, the, third, the first expression was, it was the time of the cultural revolution. <laughs> but then I remember that this, this, actually this term is a little bit <laughs> of very negative and referring to China's so-called reform. But in a way, it was a cultural revolution, if we just think of the meaning of the words, because it was the time of, uh, of these old power, power structures trembling, uh, like the, and the, like the things like Vietnam War and all the protests to that, civil rights movements, uh, like persons like Martin Luther King uh, as their leader, uh, all sorts of women rights, um, civil rights issues, and also the issue of women's rights. All of this kind of came up uh, and shaped the, the old ways of being and thinking uh, and also old power structures. So to this very kind of open, fertile uh, soil, the Zen landed. And of course, because Zen was something new, oriental, it was outside of the old ways. The, the people that were most interested in this kind of like revolutionary things, they were the people who got interested in Zen. So Zen was all, from the very beginning in the West, Zen was strongly linked with all of this. And I think that was really, it was a great thing that it happened just that, like then. Because what happened was that actually Zen did offer women like uh, real chances to do serious spiritual practice and uh, not being put down because of their gender. I mean, nothing is very simple, and even this is, if this is not simple, there are other tones also that, and other things happening there, but basically Zen was really actually giving a chance for women to, to go deep in their practice and also fulfill their aspirations. Uh, and it's also interesting to see that these teachers, like most of the teachers in the beginning were Japanese, or then they were Westerners who had been studied in Japan. Later on there were some Koreans and Chinese teachers. When these teachers, these Oriental teachers could be extremely conservative in what comes to women's rights in their own countries, but when they came to the West, they somehow adapted. Okay, this is the way. This is the, this like, like equal hippie, uh, yes, way. <laughs> this is the way. So they just took it. So then actually they kind of had double standards when they were back in Japan. It was back to that old stuff. And then they came to the United States and then the women actually could sit in the front row. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the women really took their chance to practice. So it's quite remarkable, remarkable how many of the first early Western uh, Zen masters are actually women. Uh, yeah. And I do hope that the history, because now we are kind of creating the history of Zen in Western uh, world, I really hope that the history writing doesn't forget these first women. I mean, I think this is a tendency that often happens, yeah. that women are often like pioneering in a, in a new movement, and then somehow they are tend to be forgotten when you create the kind of official history. And I really hope that this is not happening in Zen, and I must say that I, I, I have vowed to make my best to 
that not to happen with my own little contributions. Contribution for the ruler. Uh, going back to my own tradition, uh, so it was studied by Philip Kaploroshi, and among those teachers that Kaploroshi sanctioned, there were four women and something like four or five men. So that's really, that's kind of very natural, like uh, proportions. <coughs> yes. And also the first successor, successor in, in Zen is something like, is the kind of the, the, the teacher that is, that, that the master is appointing to really kind of take his legacy and continue in that place where he is teaching. So the first uh, choice for Kaploroshi for, for his uh, successor was Tony Packer. And she studied there, but then she actually felt uh, she wanted to, to start her own school, which she did. Uh, So, so this, I think it was actually a very kind of, yeah, very happy situation for, for Zen to land into the West in that particular time. Uh, and now I'm thinking of that, why am I talking so much about masters, Zen masters? Why not about just women or men in general? a different kind of practice, like just like ordinary practice, practitioners. Uh, and it is because, at least in Zen, I think that, no, no, maybe in everything, like the masters, the leaders, are kind of setting the standard. So when you look at some group, some, some community, some culture, if you look at what kind of people are the leaders, you get an understanding about quite good understanding about what is preferred and what is neglected in that particular community or tradition. So if all the leaders are men, it tells something about the values of, of that uh, culture. Or if the, all the leaders have shaved hair, head, that also tells something. Or, uh, yeah. or if there is a great kind of bigger mixture of the ways people behave, look like, that also tells something. And also because the leaders are always role models. They are, they are mirroring, I mean even, even when they don't want it maybe always, but it's always so, especially in spiritual practice, that when a person is in any kind of authority position, it's not the person that is actually seen only, but it's also the person who is looking at the leader who is mirroring her or his own hopes, fears, and also prospects about himself or herself. So when you are a practitioner and if you are happen to be a woman and there is absolutely no women role models, it's very hard for you to believe in real life that yes, Enlightenment is, is possible for all, all the people, regardless of their sex. But if there is a role model or role models that are actually women, then it's a completely different thing. Uh, and I must say that I also experienced this very clearly when I started my, my Zen practice, because uh, uh, in, in our school we had this, I think, the ideal situation that we have two teachers, or have two teachers, uh, or then had two, now we have three. Uh, one man and one woman. And their spiritual status is exactly the same. So there is no, no one above another. And just to see this, I remember the first time when I, I saw this female teacher, Kanya Udran Rashi. It was like a it was such an incredible like, impact for me, just to see that, okay, this is real. And it's interesting because I have been, as we all have been growing up in one of the most kind of uh, pro-women's right society in the world. And I think and most of, almost all the people here in this country really think that it's good for everyone if women and men have the same uh, 
chances. But still there was something kind of, some kind of distrust in me that kind of just collapsed just by seeing a female role model. Uh, and then I remember that I thought that, okay, no, well, maybe this is true. Maybe they just don't talk about, about like equal mm -hmm. possibilities. Maybe it's really true. Uh, and this is also something I'm thinking now when I'm like a Sangha leader and have been for a long time that I always often think that for women to take a stance and to just to stand there, it's not very nice often, but just to do that is extremely important. So, so... Why is it not nice? I mean, why is it not nice? Yeah, why? Why well, yeah. well, I don't think it's always nice to be the one who is in charge, yeah, because there is no one you can... I mean, it's always... always yeah, like but the, yeah, that's yeah, 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 I know, but, 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 but does it have anything to do with the sex. I, I can't, mm. this is something I don't, uh, I don't really, I mean, is, would it be different if you, I mean, of course, you're not a man, so you mm. don't know, but, mm. but I mean, just, is it this, uh, is it the gender that really identifies? No, like, no, yeah, I, I, I or mean, is it just the position? I, I think it's, yeah. I, I think that, I mean, I don't know, but most of the people who are in a leadership position find that at times, at least at times, it can be quite hard. But maybe you find it differently. Maybe you just enjoy it. I mean, uh, well, let's not talk about me. But but I just I just don't really think of that woman thing or or uh, or uh, this identification of male or female. I just uh, in my job. I okay, now I see what you see. What yeah, do you mean? Yeah, it's I just the the position with the different kinds of uh, uh, person quality uh, yeah. qualifications. Oh, right. I would be sort of very shy. Then I would have different difficulties, but mm -hmm. I don't think about the sex or, yeah. That's, so that's great, that's great. Yeah. You're very yeah. lucky, yes. I was actually thinking, it wasn't so much what I was kind of trying to say about that to take the stance is difficult to you because you are a woman, it can be that too. Yes, yes, but I said yes. more that, that because I see the tendency in women, and this is something I have been seeing in my uh, own sangha, yeah. Yeah. that there is this tendency of w women backing up yeah. and always giving yeah. the space to men, and the men naturally taking the stance. Yeah. Okay. So it can be more difficult, it kind of can take an active effort mm -hmm. to stand out. And that is something I would like to encourage, because I think it's really important, maybe not for you personally, because maybe personally you don't care a bit about those things, but maybe for the next people who are newer than you. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. 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 The, the absence would be noticed. It's, yes. like exactly. it's like yeah. the presence yes. maybe isn't important, but the absence yes. would be noticed. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And I think that, that you make a really beautiful point about uh, just seeing seeing someone that uh, you relate to as you, but sort of a few steps where you would like to be, makes it feel more possible. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, and if, if every role has an equal balance of genders, you don't even worry about it. Yeah because you're represented, yeah. but the absence is felt, and I think certainly uh, the Tibetan tradition is less gender balanced than the Zen tradition, just yeah. from the outside looking in, and, and it does have an impact in your own faith in your ability to progress and have role models and uh, mentorship of the style that suits your relative world, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Something else? Excited to see you in a leadership role over there with your colleagues. I'm sorry, I came for work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to say something about the kind of the practice path in Zen, in what comes to how you apply it to maybe to the gender topics or identities in general. Uh, I think the most common thing is that people start with this kind of relative view of them being identified with their gender, their maybe their family or their nationality and all these features that, uh, that are within their being. 
a part of their being. And, uh, and then of course, in, in when we talk about gender issues, then kind of identified with those questions. And then you come to a Zen practice, and then you learn that it's, everything is actually like, just like a flowing stream. There is nothing kind of separate and nothing uh, kind of solid. So then you are learn to just let go and experience and let go of those definitions and labels and words and all that stuff. And just experience yourself. What is it that is experiencing all of this? Experiencing the experience, the person or the thing that is experiencing. Yes. And in that stage, probably the most of the people, maybe all the people, I think, would say, could care less about any gender stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's completely uninteresting. Yeah. I mean, what does it have to do with the reality? Because the reality is this wonderful, incredible this. <laughs> and it, it has nothing to do with being a woman or a man mm -hmm. or anything. It's just this and happening and happening and happening, moment after moment. Se on erittäin hieno näkemys ja erittäin hieno paikka. Jos se on sinun paikkasi, niin mä <laughs> Todella, siis joo. Se on hieno näkemys. Useimmille ihmisille se on vaikeaa niin kuin pidemmän päälle. Useimmille ihmisille toi onnistuu rehellisesti ja aidosti hetkittäin, mutta useimmille ihmisille se on vaikeaa esimerkiksi niin kuin vaikka kokonaisen päivän ajan. Mutta mm. <laughs> 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 mä luulen, että se on itse asiassa, jos ajatellaan, että on, on niin kuin syvästi oivaltanut ihminen, niin se on se tavallaan se, on se ideaali, se on se lopputulos. Ja silloin ehkä myös jokainen asia, sinä voit olla yhtä lailla jokaisen ilmiön, jokaisen ilmiön opettaja. Se menee molemmin päin. Kaikki ovat sinun opettajasi, sinä olet kaikkien opettaja. Joo, no sitä puolta hänen kannataisi ajatella. <tos> Yes. So this ne second stage was this this uh, kind of absolute stage of, of of experiencing, and this is of course hugely liberating experience or state of being. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, something that in Zen is called kind of the peak experience, or like standing on the top of the mountain, and you see the whole world, everything clearly. And nothing is kind of restricting your view. But then you have when you are standing there, like let's say after three weeks or four five years, probably you start to think, okay, what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> and there's still like life is going on down there in the city, like and all things sort of things are are happening there. What do you do? Do you choose to stay in that spot and be just happy there? Or do you maybe go back to the world and contribute and take that view? To your real life, and that's the kind of the third third stage. Uh, and what I'm actually talk, talking here here about, I'm talking about the Bodhisattva view um, path in Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, so you go back to the world, and you start to interact and work with people and do your best. But now, from that larger view, kind of having that peak as your leading, uh, leading principle or experience. And then when you do that, then you have to, again, you have to face these questions, all these muddy, unnice, difficult, <laughs> unclear, cloudy 
questions about power and uh, desires mm. and uh, ugh, yeah. Mm. So, so in a way, then you have to face them again. <laughs> uh, and sometimes I think that in, I'm thinking of the of the uh, of the history of Zen in West, because lately there have been all sorts of scandals in many Buddhist traditions and also in Zen. All sorts of like misuses of power and uh, and uh, well misuses of power in different ways usually, or the spiritual authority. I think that is something. I mean, there are probably there are lots and lots of reasons be behind there. But I think one thing maybe is that it is not easy to come down from the peak and actually really be able to manifest that what you have experienced there. So when you come down, then you kind of really test your understanding, and you don't always succeed. <laughs> I think, mm. yeah. Uh, yes. I guess I have some more time. Yes, you you, you have. Yes, yes, yes. I would like to say something about this traditional, like women in traditional Zen countries, Zen world. So that is like the East Asia, China, Japan, Korea. They are the major Zen countries. Uh, and the history of Zen. So, and also, I'm here, my point of view, or the main point is that as a Western practitioner in modern times, how does the history kind of uh, play with you or, or show up or influence you? Yes. Uh, so the if the kind of the starting point for Zen in in the West was that it's actually it was really offering like real chances for women to practice. Uh, then when women started to practice, then of course they immediately noticed that all the history is dominated by by male teachers, male masters, and in Zen it's actually. It's in the structure of Zen that the masters are men. Because Zen is kind of the tradition is, is uh, continued by a lineage of teachers. So the first teacher gives the authority of mastery to the second teacher, to the third one, da 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 da. And theoretically, this line should go, can't start from the Shakyamuni Buddha and end up to your own teacher. And in Zen, that lineage is called the lineage of patriarchs. <laughs> <laughs> so that shows what's, what's it's, what it's about. So by definition, this master has to be a man. Uh, and of course, it's very understandable if we think of these cultures, like Zen was developed in China, this Conf Confucianist, mm -hmm. yes, that's the word, mm -hmm. yes, Confucianist uh, culture where, where women were subordinate to men in every aspect, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and then you are a practitioner, and as in our center, like in the, in, the, in the retreat center, every morning you start your practice by chanting the lineage of patriarchs. <laughs> so, I mean, I loved that. We don't do it anymore, but I love that because I felt just so connected with the world, with, the, with that lineage, with that tradition, with that wonderful practice. But I sometimes kind of curiosity, I had some curiosity, hmm, it's interesting that there is absolutely no women. Uh, and, uh, and then you start to see these kind of things. Uh, I mean, what we did in our center was that we actually don't do that anymore, but we created a new kind of tradition lineage. But it's not like a one lineage, but it's, we call it pool of radiance, kind of pool of wisdom. So where we have gathered those Zen masters, whether lay people or ordained men or women, that we felt most relevant to our tradition and our practice, and just put them together. 
and there are lots of women there. Uh, an interesting fact is that it's not going in any kind of historical order, but it's going so that we start mostly in the modern times, and then we slightly go down to the history, down to the history, and then we end up not in the in the Shakyamuni Buddha, not even the so-called mythological Buddhas before this world time and before Shakyamuni Buddha, the other Buddhas, but we end up with the primordial wisdom that is Prashna Paramita, mm -hmm. and that is depicted as a female figure in Tibetan Buddhism, mm -hmm. which is quite nice. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, so that was kind of solution, uh, try, uh, trying to, to make a solution to include women in also in the way how we see our history. But I must say that I wasn't very happy with this change, <laughs> because I felt personally that there was so much energy somehow accumulated in this old lineage. Yeah. So much of this, I mean, all this, all these practitioners for like how many hundreds of years chanting this in Japan, before that in China. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So yeah, there was a value that we lost, I think, yeah. Uh, okay, so the lineage and the master by definition was or has been man in Zen. However, this is not so simple. Uh, in Zen, there have always been female masters, and and this idea. Actually, my experience with Zen is a little bit different. What you said about maybe about Tibetan Buddhism, that I have not found any evidence that Zen. Is, would say that female, uh, women could not enlighten, get enlightened because of their female body. But it's always, that I think it's the opposite always, mm -hmm. that in Zen it's always said that everyone can in, get enlightened because everyone has the same Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. But then in practice mm -hmm. it might be difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Uh, so what were the traditional roles? In traditional Zen training for women, you could be a lay woman uh, or a nun. And in both roles, you were in a way in, a, in the outskirts of the Buddhist world. Because the nunneries usually, and they still are, that's at least in China, not in Korea, but in China, like the nunneries are poor and they don't get lots of donations and they might not get access to, to high teaching. In Korea nowadays, it's the opposite. The nuns have really good chances, and that's great. And or then you could be this kind of motherly, nurturing, supporting, caring lay woman, and that role is still very strong in Buddhist countries, these traditional countries. So if you go to a temple in, in Korea, or China, or Japan, you see these incredible strong old ladies that can work there, or sometimes they even live there, and they have absolutely no status, but they live there and they radiate and shine, they shine wisdom, and then they scrub the floor and clean the toilets and make the food for the monks. Uh, <laughs> uh, and what comes comes to the female masters, uh, they are, the history of Zen knows female masters, and some of them are like anonym, uh, so-called tea ladies. In Zen stories, they usually kind of beat up in the Dharma combat some usually little bit arrogant monk who comes to, comes to ask something. Uh, like saying, like there is a tea lady, a monk comes to comes to a tea shop and wants to buy some cakes and tea, and the lady says there, yes, I can give you the tea if you if you tell me, if you show me your mind, and then the, the <laughs> then the monk is completely like doesn't know what to say, and then the lady say, sorry, I can't give you. <laughs> Uh, and I was always thinking, before I first went to China, I thought that they are only stories. I thought that they are created because 
of like, trying to teach the arrogant young monks about humility. But then when I saw these ladies, these anonym ladies, I actually started to think that probably it's true that these <laughs> things have been happening. I would say that the most common mode for a woman who has been able in traditional Zen training to become a prominent master and get that deep, good teaching, uh, most of these women have been that kind of women who have kind of gone past their femininity. So in a way they have won their gender. And uh, I think that that tradition somehow shows still in, in Zen circles. But if I think of the female Zen masters, I would say that more of these, that mo most of the female Zen master, masters look and tend to be a little bit more masculine than feminine in their way of behaving, talking, um, acting. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it's interesting because I, I know very few males and masters who would be very feminine and manifesting those kind of like typically traditionally feminine qualities. Esimerkiksi se voisi olla sellainen, että, että on että ei esimerkiksi näytä empatiaa tai sellaista niin kuin empaattista tunnelämpöä keskustelussa, että on silleen ankara. Just practice. Niin joku tämän tyyppinen suhtautumistapa voisi olla sellainen, joka ehkä on enemmän niin kuin yleisesti sellainen, enemmän maskuliiniseksi ajateltu. Ja sellainen tietty jämäkkyys ehkä. Mutta hirveän hyvä kysymys, mikä on maskuliinista ja mikä on feminiinista. <laughs> Great. Uh, you are so. You look things from such a deep perspective. I guess she yeah. does. I have a poem here, and this is uh, written by a Chinese nun in the middle Ming Dynasty. Ming Dynasty was, was from the 14th century to the 17th century in China, and uh, this is a nun called One-Eyed Jingang. And uh, and supposedly because she had one eye. <laughs> and, and she's talking here in this poem about, about her understanding, I would say. Male or female, why should one need to distinguish false and true? What is the shape in which Guan Yin would finally take form? Peeling away the Bodhisattva's skin would be of no use whatsoever. Were someone to ask if it were the body of a woman or that of a man? So she is here talking about this, this well, exactly the same thing that you were talking about. Uh, what I have paid attention though, is that women tend to think of this much more than men. And I guess that it's because it has been so extremely important for them. Because, yeah, yeah. And like in, in Korea, and I don't know about China, but at least in Korea, it used to be the custom that nuns don't talk about, don't, they, when they refer to their kind of like dumb sisters, mm -hmm. or, or aunts, or mothers, because the Buddhist community can be like seen as a family, like a Dharma family, they actually don't use the feminine word. So... They say brother? Yeah, yeah. brother. It's in the Pure Land tradition as well. Yeah, yeah. uncle, yeah. father. Yeah. So that is showing something that there, ha there is, has been this idea that you have to go beyond your being a woman to be able to be a master. Mm -hmm. And of course that's understandable if by definition master is a man. <laughs> And thinking of that, I think it's remarkable that so many women still did it. And that just shows that their yearning and need for this practice and really to get down to the core was so big and deep. Yes. I 
I will. I want to end soon because before we get all so tired, but uh, I would come back to the to the to our culture and our time. So I think that if we think of what kind of roles and representations women there are for women in Zen today, especially in the West, I would say that the like a multitude of roles, a multitude of representations. Uh, you can be basically whatever you want, I, I would say. Um, but depending on your tradition, maybe a little bit, yes. And this kind of, this huge variety also includes all the other aspects and identities and power structures, because we are in this time, we are in this very interesting place that we don't have any set structures anymore or if we have it's natural to question it uh, so we have also very different ways of structuring buddhist sanghas and practice places some places are really kind of like there is no master everyone is just practicing together and in some places it is this traditional there is the master and then basically, if you want to practice in this place, you follow the master. Uh, I think that for Sen, maybe one of those interesting questions, however you structure your Sangha and your practice, is that, is there some feminine way of manifesting the Buddha wisdom in Zen? I mean, like in Tibetan tradition, you have the, for instance, the Dakinis. Mm. That's that's a wonderful, like, uh, yes. Mm. And in Zen, I don't think we have had that kind of thing. I mean, you can be a feminine, female Zen master if you are a Hubayatka. That has been maybe a little bit the, uh, the Hubayatka, like good guy or whatever. Right. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, I think that this is questioned at the moment in the West. And when I started, I was talking about clothing of priests. So actually, my clothing here and my hair here is kind of showing something about that questioning. Because in my tradition, when I became the novice, that was 2010, in our tradition then, if you were a priest, male or female, you would shave your hair, and then you would have extremely simple and kind of like non-gender based clothing. But not cool as your robes, but mm. just like really boring. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like just dark blue, gray, uh, black. And there is nothing wrong with this, absolutely nothing wrong, but somehow it is, feels like a stronger statement for a woman to be a shaved have a shaved head and really simple kind of baggy, baggy clothing with no patterns, no colors, than it is for men. And then we started to think that what's the point? We are not celibate. So what are we actually trying to tell to ourselves and to other people mm. by doing this? And then we changed it. So, so now I have this kind of more like, well, I don't know if what kind of hair this is, but it's not, yeah, well, it's this kind of hair and hair and, and kind of normal clothing. Uh, so this is one attempt to kind of think, okay, what can be, how can you be feminine within Zen? And how can, if you have any understanding of any, any slight understanding of wisdom, can that take place and manifest also your being wearing makeup, for instance, or lipstick. And it sounds kind of ridiculous to think of this, but if I think of the traditional Zen circles, this is a real issue. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just think that it, it, it is a question, or has been a question in all the religious traditions, yeah. all, or, or in the Uritu in the, yeah. in yeah. smile. First, women, they try to be like, sort of good guys, and then suddenly yeah. they 
then they go, why? And then exactly. yeah, <laughs> it's okay with the bank help and yeah. okay with everything. Yes. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, it's crazy it's, that it, it, it seems that it always goes this way yeah. before it finds its place or the new place to be today. Or, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. I have one question. It's maybe very simple and simplifying, but in your tradition, uh, if we think about the gender and, and maybe to teachings about that, it's not really the issue, it's something that we could go beyond. Mm -hmm. Then why the nuns and monks are living in different buildings? There is monastery mm -hmm. and nunnery, mm -hmm. and why they are not just being together and are followers of Buddha. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's repeating there <laughs> over and over again all the time, so yeah. I mean, it's, it's really the question of why is there monastic life at all? If you can become enlightened as a layperson, and of course you can become enlightened as a layperson, and all of the traditions agree on this, that you can become enlightened with family life, with a sexual life, a romantic life, with children, that those are not prohibitive to enlightenment. Why is there monastic at all? Why are there people that choose to practice in a celibate way at all? Um, and this is just an interesting question to explore. Um, and you know, from the perspective of someone who is monastic, um, a lot of us um, choose to live in this format because of um, a very deep self-awareness of the tendency to distraction. And so the distractions could be anything, and we are all distracted by any number of things, and it is not the distraction object's fault that we are drawn to it. However, we understand the habituation of our own mind and consciously withdraw from those things that habitually distract us from our path. In a similar way that someone who is a recovering alcoholic would not go into a bar, right? It's not the bar's fault, right? It's not the beer's fault. Right? But if you know that your tendency is to behave a certain way, it's maybe better not to go in. Good. Yeah, you know, and so for me, I am a recovering a samsaric creature, and I'm not even properly recovering yet. And I, um, I love relationships. I love exploring communication and intimacy and all of the fun things you can do in a relationship. And that is very distracting. <laughs> and why do you separate the genders? Because usually the genders are attracted to one another, given the right conditions. It's not to say that's the only uh, problem, and it's not like we don't uh, understand the spectrum of sexuality or anything like that, but um, minimizing distraction is the main reason to choose a monastic life. And the idea is similar to the idea of why would you go into retreat, right? And, or why would you go to the top of the mountain? You go t into retreat, into the top of the mountain, into ordination, in order to come out again. Because we are also bodhisattva practitioners and Mahayanists, and so you're withdrawing from the distraction objects to gather your strength, to deepen your understanding, so that then you could enter back into the traditional world system and not be distracted by those same objects that once really pulled your focus. So it's, again, it's not the fault of the things we're distracted by, but we understand our habits very well. And so better to interrupt the momentum of those kind of uh, temptations while you develop new skills. And then at some point you wouldn't need this framework. So the framework is not the path, but it supports the path and at some point can fall away. So you separate the genders because it's distracting if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that helps, but. It general. helps, it just, I wanted to hear from you, yeah. it, it's really there in yeah. everyday life, even Absolutely. though in uh, spiritual practice it's something that we should go beyond, but in everyday life it's always there. Absolutely, and I mean there's, you know, um, men in my life, and there are uh, men in my Dharma center, but not having in, them in the house does really save a lot of mental energy. Yeah. Who's <laughs> <laughs> with me? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> And I also think that nowadays, actually, this is also changing because in the West, the, there are very few monastic practitioners. Mm. So this is the, like, I think this is the biggest change 
of all every of like thinking of all the Buddhist traditions. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest and deepest change. Mm -hmm. What seems to be happening in the West now mm -hmm. is that the the monastic like uh, practitioners who used to be really the kind of the basis, the pillars, the holders of the Dharma, they have become a kind of minority. Yeah. So so that's that's very interesting to see what's going to happen in yeah. the future. Yes. 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 Huh? I'd like to thank you both for wonderful presentations and also offer one comment on, on the female role of Zen tradition. I, I'm a pra practitioner of the Zen Peacemaker Order and uh, it's kind of offshoot, kind of like socially engaged Buddhist offshoot mm -hmm. from the White Lama Sangha. And there's uh, lots of female teachers in that lineage and teachers who are married and have kids and so on. There's also African-American black teacher one, one in our group. But nowadays there's a kind of constant <coughs> discussion that what's the white supremacy on that lineage? Yeah. And what should we do about that, especially in America? And what's your take on racial issues? Because I was, I grew up in Africa and mm, yes. I have this kind of strong role of of identifying myself as kind of like white man, which is problematic in Africa. So, so and every time going back there, it's kind of uh, it's always a problem because I know this kind of role of, of offender. So, in this lineage, it's kind of like one of the things which is taken on, yeah. and we've had projects in Rwanda and so on, kind of trying to approach this. But I don't know, it's a, it's a problem. My feeling is that, at least if I think of, of Zen in Finland, it's such a marginal thing in Finland that we are not even close to facing those issues, simply because <laughs> we don't get people. We are very few, there are very few uh, like colored people who are coming to our introduction courses. So, and I think also that we have so few uh, still in Finland, we have so few people coming from other cultures compared to many other countries. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel that it's something that we will face in the future. Uh, and I hope that we can be aware of that, uh, but I fear that we are not. So then what is going to probably to happen is that, that those broad minded, brave, people who maybe are like from like, like black people or colored people are coming from different cultures, they somehow realize that we are completely neglecting something and we just don't see something. And then I'm extremely grateful if they take up that issue and tell us. Because if you are in this kind of pri privileged situation, it's so difficult to, to realize what's happening, what's going on. And then it's great if the other person who is not that privileged comes up and tells you. That's my hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think you know, in, in America, you know, there are two <coughs> there are two ways of kind of approaching the race issue. If you are uh, someone who identifies as progressive, one is you know, um, love sees no color. One is love sees every color, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you know, both have <coughs> pros and cons. Um, but I think that you know. Uh, all of uh, all of our teachers in the Tibetan tradition up until now are Tibetan, so they are people of color, they are Asian people, or they are Indian masters, so they are people of color. Um, but then their students are pretty white. And why are their students white? Is, an, it, uh, is it an economic issue um, in terms of, well, we know that uh, people of color are often discriminated against in the workplace and so are less likely to have good paying jobs and so maybe also less likely to have the leisure time to go to a, a group. But then again, we know that the black churches in America are really lively, beautiful places of community and connection, so maybe that's not true. You know, it is a question we ask ourselves, why, why do people of color not feel welcome in a community that was started by people of color? And I think it boils down to um, issues within the culture more than within the religion. 
because of course the Buddha himself was revolutionary in breaking the caste system and saying that caste has nothing to do with your ability for enlightenment race, has nothing to do with your ability for enlightenment gender, has nothing to do with your ability for enlightenment. That was all Shakyamuni Buddha straight talk right off the bat. It wasn't like modern interpretations that came later. That was part of why he was revolutionary. Um, but then the problem is, is that our respective cultures and their sexism or their racism co-opt the Buddha, you know, the Buddha Dharma for their own and run it through their own filters. So I think it's more symptomatic of cultural problems than religious problems. But I think as people that are working for the greater good, we need to be especially conscious to be inclusive and especially conscious to listen deeply when we hear we're falling short um, with all areas where people are vulnerable. <coughs> I don't know. I don't know if you agree or not, but I think it's it's more a cultural issue than yeah, a religious issue. Yeah. yeah. So one of the examples was that the Los Angeles Zen Center, which is kind of like one of the bases of our lineage. Yeah. They have a lot of space in there because they have apartment buildings and they have Zendo buildings and all that. And at the same time, it's located in Koreatown, one of the horror, the, one of the worst places of homelessness in Los mm. Angeles. And they were constantly thinking about what we can do about homelessness and should we donate food and so on, what they do. And mm. they, they constantly do things for the homeless around there. But then they realized that we have places here, we could actually accommodate homeless people here. Yeah. That's what they do now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's good. <laughs> Slowly, slowly. I think just the fact that we have the, the conversation is a good sign, but I mean, we all could be so much more inclusive in our thinking um, and less reactive about our own feelings of exclusion, you know, both ways. Because there's ways we can feel alienated because we feel like everyone in the center is younger than us or richer than us or more educated than us, and we can choose to feel exclusion even if exclusion isn't present. But if exclusion is present, to know it's not the Dharma, it is the people trying to attempt to practice it in their mistaken way. You know? She would like to have a practical <laughs> advice. Mites for is to gather the strength of mind in relation to food. Mm. She's thinking of it from the morning until evening. She the food. Thinks about Think food. Thinks about, about food. food. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Practical advice. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? I'm also very interested. In it. <laughs> Well, the easiest thing would be saying that find another more creative craving. <laughs> I would say. Because it's unhealthy to eat too much and it's, it's suffering to think of it uh, all the time. So, like, this very practical, like, instant advice would be that just find a very creative, that some like a craving that creates good results, like studying Buddhism. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look, I, I think it, it's, I mean, you're touching like the human condition. Yeah. yeah, this is the human condition. And it's not necessarily food is all of our issue, but we have a very weird relationship with food because we think it is happiness. Yeah, and if the food is happiness, if I put it into my mouth, now I have happiness inside, you know? And so you're thinking about what you call food, but what you're really thinking about, I think, is how do I become happy? And food is a format that often brings happiness, but we think that it's the cause of happiness when in fact it's a condition. Yeah, the real cause of the happiness is our mental state, but because of the relationship you've developed with food, then you start to think of the condition as the cause. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it relieves, kind of gives this feeling of relief. Yeah, it gives a feeling of relief. Yeah. And if, again, you know, we use these classic teachings on attachment to, to investigate that with more curiosity and say, if it was really happiness or relief 
to eat, no matter how much you ate in one sitting, it would continue to give you relief and happiness every single bite, even if you ate without stopping. And you know that at some point it would turn into suffering, right? And actually, I was, and I, was, I was just kind of joking, or kind of like it was the first thing what came into my mind when I was answering you, but actually I do think that it is a very good advice to create a new habit a new craving that is actually harmonious and it's giving you positive re results because it's so extremely difficult to attack straight to the kind of the, the, the root of attachment itself it's very difficult uh, and also because what we have I mean if, if I think of this path this is the path of trans transformation so what is transformed well everything that is not kind of okay everything that is making us to suffer and that is the craving so then that is exactly the craving that has to be transformed so use that craving in the creative way and maybe not with food but maybe with something else so that will not kind of immediately solve the problem in itself but maybe if you find another craving that can lead you slowly to give up the whole craving yeah, that would be actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree, and 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 it's you know there's there's like steps, right? And you know sometimes, we, if we understand the nature of what attachment is like in our mind, then we can stop believing it. But if we don't know what attachment is like, we assume our thoughts are accurate and true. But you know sometimes when you're in a very craving space, if you interrupt it, it ruins the momentum and you stop wanting it. Like say you're really obsessing about something, whatever it is, food or whatever, and then the phone rings and you have to speak to someone on the phone mm -hmm. for 5-10 mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. After you put the phone down, sometimes the craving has been interrupted and you're like, oh, not so important. Mm -hmm. Right? And so if you know that what craving says to you is not real, sometimes you can tell yourself, I will eat, but in 10 minutes. And so you're, you're sort of like, you know, not saying no, not ever triggering rebellion. You're saying, no, I can eat just in 10 minutes. And then you know, have to do something for 10 minutes and it breaks the continuity of that hunger. And then often after 10 minutes, you find you don't want it. Yeah, or you want it in a more reasonable way. So sometimes just interrupting the speed or the feeling of urgency that attachment gives us. Attachment gives us a lie that says you have to do this now or you will not be happy. And happiness is only through this channel. So sometimes just breaking the circuit is enough to reawaken your wisdom. Sometimes that. Say, yes, I can, just not now. Yeah, and then come back to it. But, you know, attachment is one of those things that will be with us for a very long time. And, and we know that suppression doesn't work it will lead to a rebellion or an internal implosion. Um, to notice it, what is its qualities, to be curious about it and, and not judgmental towards yourself, to feel kind of expansive, like here I am touching the human condition. There's nothing wrong with me that's not wrong with every other person. It just looks different person to person. Sometimes also then the shame is less or the um, grief about it can be less. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> Do you have more questions or comments? So, anyone? Well, I could comment on that food related question. It also uh, best makes sense with the gender. Because I've been studying mm -hmm. that female hormones cause this, that if the blood level of sugar mm -hmm. balance changes, uh -huh. men, men's mood doesn't change that but many female have this that the mood changes if you have like a low blood sugar level. Oh, so this okay. is also <laughs> a <different laughs> thing. Yeah. But then maybe I don't know <laughs> can I give any advice on this as a man maybe, maybe <laughs> like, uh, if you know that this is biological that, mm. that it's mm -hmm. just lower level of blood sugar that also gives more anxiety if mm. you don't 
yeah, you, you understand your being. It's definitely yeah. so. I think. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also generally with other things. Like when you don't identify with all your like bad things and, and failings and cravings uh, completely, but still do your best, then it's kind of a little bit lighter mm -hmm. to live because it is human to have all of these problems. Of course, then it is very good also not to identify with your good sides because then you get to into this grandiosity illusion. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's the question of mercy. I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, I always think that when you look at yourself wanting to eat something, be merciful. It's okay. It's not that. I mean, you're not going to kill someone, or it's a. It's, 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 it is just a question of food. So maybe you, you just feel merciful to yourself and laugh a bit to yourself and think, "I'm here again, thinking of this food. How funny!" And then suddenly it's. Uh, it, it's it's not that uh, it's, it doesn't make you suffer so much. Mm -hmm. I, I think it has something to do. You were talking about the Buddha nature, mm -hmm. and uh, and that all the bad things are sort of, not you don't identify yeah. with yeah. those. Yeah. But I, I agree completely. But then again, I just yeah, I just need everything there because yeah. it's so yeah. interesting and it's so so uh, so nice to to see oh this 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 I was grieving on this and mm -hmm. uh, so to see everything. In, in the light of uh, mercy, so it's, yeah. uh, I don't. It, it would be very interesting to question or to have this discussion about mercy in your tradition because mercy it's, it's tradition. because it's I'm sure you have it. Yeah, yeah. But so one, I'm sure you have it. But yeah. but it's it's just uh, it is just we are uh, we don't talk of that so much because it's always a way that you have, you are. It looks a bit yeah. strict outside, which yeah. I know it's not. But but it's uh, it's a very very interesting way yeah. where to find it or how to accept everything. Yeah. It's you know it's it's almost you know mercy. I also we have to define what is mercy. Yes, yes. But I mean generally speaking, you know, the advice for meditation and the advice for walking around yeah. is quite similar. Which is as things arise, yeah. you don't have to believe them, exactly. but you're also not suppressing them, yeah. and you're also not feeding them. How do you live in that place where things are able to roll through naturally without blocking them, without uh, giving them more speed and more energy than they deserve? So you have the space to choose which thoughts are worth keeping in which I can let die a natural death. Yes. You know? yes. Yeah. But yeah, I'm curious how you would define mercy. Yes. I, I think the, quite the same way. Because okay. I think that uh, all the things in, in life are... They can... The things they themselves they are not good or bad. Yeah. Or it's uh, I'm not a Roman priest, so they this, it says in the Bible that everything is legal for you, but everything's not good for you. So, right. <laughs> so, it's, so it's, it's kind of sort of you, you just see everything then you, and you accept that oh this mm -hmm. came up and then you let it go. So yeah. It's, it's, I think we are having a quite a life. Yeah. But Something. It's, we maybe, yeah. Like acceptance but not indulgence. Yeah. Somehow acceptance yes, without yeah, yes. or something. Yeah. And I also think of that that from a Buddhist point of view, at least for me, or Zen Buddhist, Zen point of view, whatever that would be. Uh, <laughs> now using that word that I said that doesn't really exist. Uh, I think the key is that is actually the realization, the personal realization of your non-self. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That means that you person that you actually see into this nature that is not uh, your identifications, mm -hmm. not your appearances, not this how it like seems to be, and yet it is that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and because what happens is that this incredible connection with everything and all the beings rises from that. And when that rises, then it's, what What else can you do than feel gratefulness and, and kind of forgive yourself and forgive others? Because you simply see that everyone is doing their best all the time. And then you just try to do your little share. Oh. Isn't that yeah. a little bit like mercy? It is. I just, well, 
everybody is doing their best, yes, yeah. but still there are wounds in the of world. Of course, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, we identify this sin and mercy thing. It's, mm. Sin is everything that takes you apart yeah. from God. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the mercy is everything that unites it. Yeah. And it's, uh, so it's uh, basically, I think even though we try, we don't always succeed, but it's, it's still okay. But then when yeah. you see it from yeah. the point, point of view or experience of mercy, yes. that I would guess that somehow could be something like experiencing your own yes. self. Yes. yes. Then then in that moment yes. there is this Yes, absolutely. Really yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. 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 Yeah. And uh, and we completely rehabilitate the image of Christianity by defining sin and mercy in these two ways and now everyone is like, "Oh, I can be Christian. I'm coming back to church." Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, no, but it's 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 not the way I was thinking of, of your tradition also because we have also the well the patriarchs in mm-hmm. our life, of course but but it's uh, it all it is always to find the words that are used sort of today okay. yeah and to have this you don't use the same words as patriarchs yeah. years ago in China or yeah. in, uh, but we have to sort of put the religion or the spiritual talk to 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 uh, this language that mm. is used today. Yes, I think language is so yeah. important. Yeah, it's it's going the same. It all it all comes together. We have the same the same issues. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yeah. It's, it's not Absolutely. Depending on the religion. It's, uh, yeah. And what we would sort of class as effective, beneficial, connecting, yeah. and what we would reference as harmful, disconnecting, yeah. oppressive, exactly. it kind of winds up being the same yes. definitions yes. at their root. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. In the Zen peacemaker tradition, there's actually a lot of Christian priests who have been, or uh, kind of like, gave the transmission of Biro Roshi, as well oh, as Catholic okay. priests and Jesuits and so on. Yeah, cool. Yeah. 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 And we have people like Bertha and Melo who, who yeah. they were sort of living in. This dialogue all the time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. It's, it's, it's enriching, I think, can be enriching yeah. for yeah. All, all involved. Yeah. But also, Islamic imams. So. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Because this, I will, uh, I'll go. <laughs> but, but I was I was at Zen Center one, there was a, this one meditation, and there was this, I don't know, what was her name? There was this lady from Zen Gordon, or our teacher, Kanye yeah. I guess. Maybe yes. Yes. Okay. So she was there, and she was actually saying that it's it's not even in, in Buddhism. It's not about uh, it, that. It, it is a way, and it was not. It was something very very interesting. She, she said, and it was not sort of related. You didn't even have to be a Buddhist no. to meditate, no. and this is. Uh, you have to do the do the practice. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And it, I mean the practice, yeah. this contemplative life. Is, is the same in yeah. Islam, yeah. In, yeah. in Christianity, it's, yeah. it's the same everywhere. So you find the same, uh, through different uh, traditions, yes. you find yes. quite the same way of living. Yeah, and I think you know it's interesting in the in the Buddhist tradition, especially in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, where we practice a lot of uh, tantra, the Vajrayana tradition, is the concept of not just seeing that the self lacks inherent existence, but consciously adopting a persona. Right? So say what you're working on is compassion. You adopt a persona of one form of compassion looks very peaceful. One form of compassion looks very wrathful and strong. One form of compassion looks female. One form of compassion looks male. And you're adopting different personas to see which is the way where uh, compassion can be felt and transmitted in this context at this time with these people. Which, you know, by adopting an identity helps you destroy your identity. But it's not like you're pretending there is nothing there. You know, it's, it's an interesting kind of um, exercise for your mind. And, uh, you know, it also means that you're using the frameworks that we're already habituated to working within. You're just bringing wisdom to them. We exhausted ourselves with questions now. <laughs>
Any more questions or comments? So, no inherently existent gender, therefore be kind. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like,